Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. Sorry, we're running a couple minutes late. We had a little technical issue, but, but thank you for joining us. We're looking really forward to a terrific conversation with Juliana Richardson, who is a real pioneer um, in creating this important new, really, resource called the History Makers, which is effectively the custodian of this wonderful archive of over 3,000 interviews with prominent African Americans from President Obama to Colin Powell to Ernie Banks to Jesse White, Illinois Secretary of State, but also and maybe even more importantly to just people we probably had not heard about, you know, everyone from educators, artists, dancers, ministers, lawyers, uh, doctors, Pullman car porters, Negro League baseball players, Tuskegee Airmen, civil rights activists, just really kind of the whole tapestry of the African-American experience. It's a wonderful resource that Juliana has created. And let me tell you a little bit about her. She grew up in Pittsburgh, lived in some smaller towns in Pennsylvania, but spent a lot of her formative years in Newark, Ohio, attended um, Brandeis University, studying both theater and American studies, uh, went to Harvard Law School, earned a degree there, started out in private practice in Chicago, did some interesting creative things in the world of cable TV, um, and then found a calling to, to create the History Makers in 1999. Um, she's been profiled on everything from 60 Minutes to um, uh, Football Morning in America. Actually, I had initially saw her on 60 Minutes and the segment re-ran last night. So congratulations to that. Hopefully she'll have another appearance this fall on Football Morning in America, but has uh, really done remarkable work and we're really eager to hear more about the History Maker. So good morning, Juliana. Hi, how are you doing? Good morning. Great. Good morning. Well, as I, I read about your background, I was struck by so much. I mean, you grew up in Pittsburgh and lived in some smaller towns. And you talked about living, I think, in a town called Duquesne. And you said something. You said the sky was never blue. It was orange. And talking about kind of the, the mill towns outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, Talk yes, about I'm, I'm talking about the mill towns. And actually, I was born in Pittsburgh, but really grew up in, in Duquesne until we moved to Newark, Ohio. Okay. Well, tell us about that kind of community, because I, I read in another article, you said, I, you know, I was a child who lived in my head. What was the, uh, and I should say your folks were really interesting people. Your dad served in the military and was, a, I think, a golf pro. Your mom was a music teacher, a uh, piano teacher, excuse me. So tell us about, about the early years growing up. And uh, Yeah, I grew up, I grew up with my, um, my, you know, my family, my mother's family around. Well, my father had one brother and he was, we were in a steel mining town and he was um, in a coal mining town. My grandfather had actually um, been in a, tra my, on my father's side, my grandfather had been in a tragic accident and sort of burned alive coming home from the mill. Um, they, you know, in, in uh, Blythdale, as they called it, not Duquesne, um, that was sort of a town, you know, a mill town completely where the Negro baseball league players would come through and, and the men would come home from the mines, um, you know, with their checks. I mean, um, mill life doesn't matter, you know, your race or color was hard. Um, and, um, um, you know, a lot of missing fingers. And um, I remember my grandfather coming home with his, you know, the black lunchbox filled with soot. <clears throat> and, you know, often, and we have these stories in our collection, you know, people, uh, Friday nights were the time to sort of let down your hair. But it was, I grew up in the church. My mother was very active in the church, um, our family church. I was Macedonia Baptist Church. We, um, um, you know, I'm growing up in a lovely, loving family, and um, it was just, you know, the other last night I called one of my cousins and I said, Papa, Papa made it on 60 Minutes. You know, Papa was born a slave, and, and you know, when he would come around to his different kids' home, you know, um, you know, my 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 uh, role was to bring him uh, ice cold water, you know. But at that point in time, you know, it was whispered, you know, that he was born a slave. You knew that slavery was a, you know, not a positive thing. Um, but you know, when Papa died, actually, and I just saw this recently, 
there were like he had 130 descendants. You know, he had that side of the family was pretty entrepreneurial. He had moved north when his kids had moved north from Georgia. Um, he um, there's a part he actually owned a grocery store. Um, and um, but when I, you know, by the time I was born, that that was, you know, long ago, he had I had the grocery store in this little town, the town. It's amazing. I just visited the town because one of our cousins died. And, you know, I have these flashbacks and memories, um, you know, about when I see that part of the family you know, of growing up in the town. And when um, the town, like, there was no, I went to look at my grandpa, like, I wanted to go back so badly. And my cousin said, there's nothing left to the town, except the black church was there. But like, I, um, I found the base of my grandmother's um, house. But what sort of struck me is the town is gone. And it would have grown up with overbrush and we lived on a very steep hill, Second Avenue, and it was all covered with other, other brush, but I found, uh, walked down the street to where my grand, my uncle's store, Uncle CD's store was there, and walked um, also over to the church and just sort of stood in the church. It was, I kept thinking about all the lives that had populated that town. Um, and um, and that was the same thing uh, when I, you know, I, my, my cousin with me and we went out to Blythdale, same thing, church, still there, maybe just a few members, but the town was a ghost town. So those towns created a lot of people that went on to extraordinary things. Um, and uh, so that, that, that's my, you know, that's the beginning of my, you know, growing up. Um, and uh, my father was in the service for uh, 30 years. Um, my mother was his second wife. And so when he retired, um, there was some talk of him going to Alaska, but he had been away. And I'm a daddy's girl through and through. And um, so we moved to Newark, Ohio, and I was age nine. And you know, wanting very much, you know, I remember when we moved there, like the next day I go, because you know, I go, is that our land? You know, and it went out, it seemed like it went out so far. And so Newark began, a, a, you know, a second chapter, um, still involved in the Black community. My father started the first uh, Boy Scout troop that started in that town. But, you know, what I think extraordinary is that I didn't know any of the Black history and 60 Minutes has put Newark on the map, you know, and people are coming sort of out of the woodwork and the history that I, you know, spoke of, I have just since, you know, in the last few years learned that history. Right. Well, I was struck by the fact that I think you, you had kind of an artistic bent as a child, and I think still do, but um, you had, I think, a really formative experience at Interlochen, um, camp a kind of an arts camp in michigan yeah. you know i had a college friend who spent some of her, her her years there and found it just a hugely um important experience talk about interlocking for you oh very very much and i would say even my creativity like as a young kid in duquesne i used to think because i watched lots of tv you know that someone from hollywood come and find me so obviously you know creativity is of, you know, something you're born with. And I think really, you know, a gift. But I got a scholarship my last year of Interlock, and that was a big deal for me to be able to go there. Um, someone else had gone there who was in theater with me and and um, at Newark High School. And we had a really good theater department. We're located very close to a university called Denison that had a great theater department there. And um, that that experience in Interlochen was transformative. Um, uh, they had um, small class sizes, and you know, every day at the beginning, uh, you know, we I started out with a dance class, and we would have four hours of theater a day. And so when I came out of um, 
you know, out of that theater department uh, to Brandeis. And my father at this point, you know, who always wanted to be a lawyer, he's like, my day of graduation, he's like, so what are you planning to do? And I go, theater. <laughs> and he was like, he wanted me to go to law school. So hence the law, the legal background, once again, a daddy's girl. But no, interlocking was transformative. Um, and um, excellent theater training. So by the time I get to Brandeis, I'm in a main stage play my first semester that was written up in the Boston Globe. And then I'm in a touring production of Lenny Bruce that goes to London. So it's, um, no, it, it was love interlocking and love anything to do with the university. I've been back, I mean, with the, the school and have been back to speak there. You know, in fact, I had the most amazing experience with the students. The last time I was there, I spent two days with the theater students and, you know, talked about my journey and, and the project. And I gave them an assignment. I said, you know, uh, you're theater students. And I broke them up into groups. And I said, I want you to go into the collection and find stories that resonate with you and come and let me see what you do with them the next day. And I, the teacher said, he came and he says, they, you have created like all kinds of havoc because they are like, they're not black, you know, because there are a few black kids, they're not black. And, you know, what is she giving us this assignment for? And I said, well, you're not alcoholics either or any of the other characters you portray. So I'm sure you can do it. And the work was extraordinary, extraordinary work. Well, let's talk about Brandeis because you're Brandeis and I think it's your sophomore year and you're, um, you're doing an independent research project on the Harlem Renaissance, and you're listening, uh, you're doing research in Harlem, and you're listening to mu music, and you came across a, um, a a selection by a team called Sissel and Blake, uh, and the tune is called I'm Just Mad About Harry, um, and, and you talk about that and the series of events that followed it as what you called a defining moment. Talk about that little, that musical selection and, and how that connects to your, to your subsequent journey. Yeah, so I had, um, had been, I was, I chose to be uh, both a theater and American studies major because my father wanted me to go to law school. And I was in my sophomore year. And so I um, um, actually, a uh, friend of my father's, Bubba from Duquesne, Pennsylvania, um, Blythdale, sorry, Blythdale, puts me up. He's like a swinging bachelor, and I'm staying there and I'm doing my research. And Gene Blackwell Hudson, who was a famous librarian at the time, um, had given me a list, and um, that formed my research. And so and I was interviewing people, too, based on her list. The novelist Alice Childress wrote to me, and I just came across that letter, and she's like, Harlem Renaissance, that means uh, rebirth, recoming. All the artists were poor, still poor, you know, poor, poor, um, uh, unrecognized. But um, I was listening that day at the Schomburg, uh, waited on by um, Jean Blackwell Hudson. And this song, it's I'm Just Wild About Harry. I'm not mad, but wild about Harry. Written by Noble Sissel and... Um, U.B. Blake in the 1921 production of Shuffle Along on Broadway. And this is a song I associated with President Harry Truman. I mean, no one could have told me, I, you know. And so I'm like, I cannot believe that this song is written by this Black songwriting team. Really, you know, when I, the story that I didn't tell was me lying about my family background in Newark, Ohio, when I'm age nine, because everybody has... Their hands, I mean, those hands went up so fast in the sky. They were part German, part Italian, part French. And I was like, whoa. Um, and um, and so I had lied about my family background because I didn't. So that day was a defining moment for me because I'm learning all these things about the Black experience that I never knew, never had been taught, never knew. And the sad thing, you know, as you see in 60 Minutes is things haven't changed much and where, you know, Black history is under attack now. And I like saying, you know, you can't 
attack people's experiences that are their real life experiences and say, that's okay. You know, so, um, but no, that was a defining moment that day. Right. Well, I want to talk just for a, a couple minutes about your legal background in, in Chicago, because you, you went to Harvard, you know, hugely prestigious, went to, came back, came to Chicago, a very prestigious firm, Jenner and Block, I believe it's called. And I think your, your initial hope was to do um, law that were related to the arts that was not providing, uh, there weren't the opportunities that you're hoping for. And then you became extremely entrepreneurial. You were involved in cable TV. I think you actually created one of the first home shopping networks in Chicago. Talk about that kind of entrepreneurial uh, bent that you... Um, I know, ultimately... you know, I say my life has been this series of short, very intense moments. Um, but I, um, yes, I did create a home shopping channel. And often, like when I'm in that part, you know, because I speak to a lot of academic circles, you can hear the screeching, you know, the old school, like, what? And in fact, one um, archivists one told me that they didn't know what to make of me, but um, no, I um, what it was really. I mean, a lot of these are I'm out of a job, so I had um, been let go from the cable office, um, and um, because there had been a change of administrations, I come under the burn administration, and and so I was with actively involved all my friends are working on their Washington administration and you know I'm a supporter of um, Mayor Washington but I so I find myself without a job and um um you know didn't really at that point cable television which now it seems like a dinosaur but cable television was just beginning but no one would hire me you know and so I was you know, I started this home shopping channel because someone said, you know, people are not, um, um, they're, you know, they're buying off these cable, you know, these home shopping channels. So I researched that we were one of two regional home shopping channels in the United States, and others started by uh, a family group in New Orleans. Um, and this is in addition to the QVCs and the home shopping networks. But I really, you know, that was a seminal moment because I remember I only know theater. I don't know anything about production. And so I learned a lot. And then uh, the cable companies asked me to take over their channels. And I managed these channels with these local producers for years and served then also as C-SPAN's local production arm. And I say all roads really led me to that place because I don't think I would have ever gotten involved in production. And I had my own equipment, even though my home shopping channel went belly up. I had my own equipment. That equipment eventually is what seeds the beginning of the history makers. Well, and I want to, I think we've come to kind of a pivotal point because you're you're at a conference in, uh, I think, an ABA American Bar Association conference in Memphis. National Bar, National Bar Association. Okay. And you're, you're listening to a presentation on, um, I think it's Martin Luther King, and there's several of his, his assistants who maybe were not as prominent as others. And you're sitting there listening to their stories, and you had this kind of eureka moment. So recount that for us, if you yeah. will. So I was at the National Bar Association because really I'm at a confused time in my life. I mean, this is the other confused after um, when I don't really know what I want to do. And my mother gives me a, a gift, a trip to um, to um, Memphis, and it's the National Bar Association conference, and it's a hotly contested conference. The National Bar Association is the Black Bar. And I love uh, Judge Leon Higginbotham. And he was railing against the appointment of Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court. And so I'm, you know, there are panels there. And that was hotly contested, but there was a panel and one was on, you know, Martin Luther King. And there was Judge Constance Speaker Motley and um, Reverend Billy Kyles, who was, was on the uh, balcony when um, uh, Martin Luther King got shot. And the it was just like I sat there because I'm literally you know trying to ponder what I'm going to do, and a friend of mine, um, Catherine Lauderdale, had been talking about archives, and you know because a lot of the TV stations she was general counsel 
of our local PBS station. Um, and they had been WTTW and uh, they had, um, she had been tasked with indexing those collections. So that's on my mind, you know, as I'm sitting there. And I just, it was like, you know, people don't know these names, you know, even though they know Martin Luther King's name and yet they were extremely important to the movement. And the name literally came to me, the history makers. And I come running back to Chicago and I go, Catherine, I know what I'm going to do. It's an archive of Black people. And she had much to my dismay. She goes, she didn't like the idea. You know, and I go, but no, you've been talking about archives. And she goes, so they did an intervention that, you know, on a Saturday. You know, they were like, what are you doing, uh, Richardson? Can you outline it? And um, and so, you know, I had my little board up there explaining, you know, what I was doing. And I was reading, you know, this is what I don't think people know, that especially with technology, and I found this very much in the cable industry, uh, technology and advancements are often talked about uh, way before uh, they're implemented. Um, you know, we see that now with AI, you know, um, and so um, that was, um, that was a seminal moment um, uh, that, um, you know, it was a seminal moment and um, hence the beginning of the history makers, because I've been reading about um, archives and digitization and those things. Well, let me read a couple sentences from your 2022 annual report, which will kind of you know, sharpen our focus on the history makers, because in, in your, 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 your annual report, you say, since its inception, the history makers has grown to be the digital repository for the Black experience. With education as its mission and the Library of Congress as its official repository, this one-of-a-kind collection provides an unprecedented an irreplaceable physical and online record of African-American lives, accomplishments, and contributions through unique first-person testimony. Over the past 22 years, over 3,471 video oral history interviews comprising 12,000 hours have been recorded in 451 cities and towns, um, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Europe across a variety of disciplines. So, and and Julianne, I, I, at one point I saw something you said, which uh, really kind of sharpens the focus of the history makers. You, you, at one point you said, our goal is to rescue the 20th century before it's too late. It, amplify that in connection with the, the kind of fundamental mission of the history makers. Um, um, that is... Uh... Uh, thank you for that, because um, obviously I started out um, with a, a, a personal project that I um, was hoping would resonate, you know, that there was this need to record first person stories um, and that we would pick up where the WPA project left off with the recording of the formerly enslaved. There were 2,300 formerly enslaved interviewed between the years of 1936 and 1938, but there have been no major attempt to record the Black experience in the post enslavement um, period, time period, which you know, represents really the 20th century. What I've learned though, um, in the process is that um, our nation's libraries, museums and archives simply don't have black people in them. And not only that, uh, there is a predominance of, of racist literature there. And, um, and so, I don't um, really, I'm not uh, one of these people that believes in the, and this may be controversial, but I don't believe in the tearing down of monuments. I believe in the raising up of these other voices that so there can be conversations um, across um, different ethnic groups. And I really don't think that we as a nation can have the true melting pot unless the parts sort of come together. Um, and 
And so that that's that's where I am. So the, what I learned, I mean, I would say maybe starting a decade ago, because I'm, you know, I'm interviewing. We've interviewed these people, and we have probably now twelve thousand, almost thirteen thousand of uh, hours of uh, of first person um, um, narratives. But the the documentation, the visual imagery, the other things that will supplement uh, the oral histories are equally important. And I started to see like, you know, like the Army Heritage Center, they are a partner of us. They have 25 million for digitization. Um, they have millions of objects. Um, they control all the uh, content that's in the Army military museums. And when I asked them how many Black people they had in their collection, they had one, Benjamin O. Davis Sr. We got them to go west, who was the first, you know, Secretary of the Army. Uh, but, you know, when I last talked to them, I was like, guys, have you digitized? And they were like, no. And I go, seriously, you got two Black people, you can't prioritize. So I need to, you know, check in with them this year. But that's, that's the, the, the focus now is really being on the digital repository for the Black experience. Whether we do that, we're focused on our history makers. We're now the digital repository for, um, for, uh, Ursula Burns was the black first black female CEO, um, legendary entertainer, Eartha Kitt, um, Susan Taylor from Essence Magazine, and um, Ed Lewis is the founder of Essence Magazine, and there are others that we're working on. But this is a collective work. This is not like one entity's work um, because it's going to take... Um, Lots of people joining in our effort and whether our activism will activate collecting that doesn't exist in preservation and digitization is key because it doesn't require people to get in a, uh, you know, in their car or drive or, you know, fly like I, you know, when I went to the Schomburg in, in the 70s and looked um, but it's really key. Um, and so that, that's what my, uh, my mission is. And it will be my mission until I take my last breath. We're going to lose the 20th century if we don't. Well, one of the stories I love the way you tell is um, you are going to, I think, a relatively early interview with William Thompson, who was a Tuskegee Airman. And it's maybe one of, one of those days where it was a long day and you're like, oh, my gosh, here we go again. But then you have this remarkable interview with him. And then he says, oh, by the way, there's a really interesting person upstairs who you might want to talk to, a, a gentleman by the name of William Sylvester White. Talk about those kind of back-to-back -back interviews. And at one point you said, it was one of those moments when I knew I was on the right path. Right. Uh, that you've, you've recounted it. I mean, it was our first year, like it was... November, like the, or maybe October of, um, of the year 2000, when we started doing interviews. And I was really thinking like, why am I going to Colonel Thompson? Because the people don't know him. And you know, we're an unknown entity and you need some well-known to give you validation. And so, but when we got there, I mean, he had prepared, I mean, really his things are in the Air and Space Museum. He was, the, what I didn't know, before I got there was that he was the chief documentarian for the Tuskegee Airmen. And he had really prepared for us for four days and he had boxes of material. And that's when he sat me down and, you know, and told me, you know, there, there are four, um, there, there are these things called the Golden 13. They were the Navy's version of the Tuskegee Airmen. There are four left living in this country, and one lives upstairs, and he wants to talk to you also. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. That has been our project from its inception. It's all about discovery. You know, whether we're doing an interview and in partnership with the person, helping to discover their, you know, or, or it's on our digital archive and it's there for discovery. I mean, yeah, that's what I knew. Mm -hmm. Well, in 2001, you had a, a kind of an interesting conversation with an obscure Illinois state senator who was kind of busy, but you persuaded him to sit down and visit with you a little bit. Talk about that. 
Yeah, he was tired that day. He had been, and you know, um, I mean, we know him now, and I, you know, as I said on 60 Minutes, extraordinary that, you know, that's 2001 and 2008, he's president of the United States, you know, but he was sort of stuck at that point in the Illinois uh, State Senate, you know, trying to sort of figure out what his next move was. He was tired, you know, he had arrived tired. But what is extraordinary about that interview is um, it's very consistent, you know, um, to the messaging that has, you know, that continued through his presidency. And, um, you know, he had this extraordinary background, you know, and there's this beautiful description, you know, of his um, time in Southeast Asia. You know, I mean, so it's it's really, I would encourage, you know, everyone to look at that, you know, that interview in its entirety. And in our digital archive, you can look at pieces, you know, or you can look at the entire interview. Well, one point, Juliana, that you make a lot is just kind of the urgency of this work, because, you know, as pe you know, we have, you know, elderly people who've had some remarkable experiences. And I, I saw one interview where you said there's a saying that every death is like the burning of a library. Um, and so many stories, so many, you know, important narratives that that need to be heard. I mean, how do you how do you organize your pipeline of potential interviews. I mean, you have 15 or so kind of broad areas that you are trying to um, to to address. But I mean, how how do you work now in terms of all these stories you want to tell with just scarce time and resources? Yeah. Well, let me let me just um, add to the story of Barack Obama that he was unknown. Think about that. Yeah, he I was know. not known. So it was really important that we do well known and unsung, but we have, as you uh, rightly noted, we've always had 15 different categories from law to business to mu and music and entertainment and sports, which we thought were covered well, but we're finding that they weren't. And even a fashion and beauty category and so civic um, business. I mean, lots of areas that people don't know. And so we formed uh, 16 advisory committees. They advise us. We we um, have lists um, and we've been getting in recommendations that have been really extraordinary by people who know, but it's a fight. Each interview costs us $6,000. Um, we we're based in Chicago and we've done almost 800 interviews and Chicago's always pulling out our tails. You know, and I'm like, it's a big world out there. And so there are significant areas. And I would say, you know, we do interviews, um, um, by region. So we'll take one or two and sort of build around that. And so when we're going into a community, we're doing 10 interviews in a week. Um, on average, uh, we're trying to work up uh, to our uh, pre-pandemic levels, which are two, 200 250 interviews a year. Um, you know, I originally had said that I would do 5,000 interviews and we still are not there. And, um, you know, I was hoping I could be like Steven Spielberg, you know, but uh, we didn't have those resources. So, um, but the collection is really extraordinarily significant. And you talk about those children and featured in 60 Minutes. We just be, um, had a education institute where we had K through 12 through college and to see the light bulbs going off in the, the teachers and faculty heads. I mean, I'm just very hopeful, even given the times for it. Right. When I wanted to, to talk a little bit about this, this educational component of your mission, because I know it's hugely important. And, and History Makers, as I understand, it, has been licensed to 187 colleges and universities and K through 12 schools. Um, talk about just sort of the mechanics by which, you know, schools sign up what that provides, you know, what, what that provides them, and also just the, the special curriculum you've developed called Achievement Makers, and then with the subtitle, It's Cool to Succeed. Right. So thank, thank you for that, because education was always part of our mission. I mean, always part of the mission. And, and so um, we, um, 
there was a point that, you know, in the urban schools, it was almost impossible because they didn't have the technology. COVID made that possible. So we're really, that number is now 200 um, colleges and universities, museums and libraries. Um, we, um, in the library, so I need to, I, it would be derelict upon me not to acknowledge the extraordinary support and work of Carnegie Mellon University, who has worked with us for 21 years, almost with no support. And they're in the sandbox. We often fight, you know, they're they're like they they're they're always trying to add and make things better. And so I, we would not be here. But the thing was to make things accessible. You know, it's the digital archive is hosted in the cloud, everything's digitized. It is fully accessible on, you know, iPhones and portable devices. And so the licensing entity, whether it's a school or library or college and university pays um, a fee, though really on the public, um, the K through 12, we don't really charge. And, um, and then it's free to the users. So like Chicago Public Library, New York Public Library, Charlotte, they, um, Miami, um, LA, they just, Detroit, Philadelphia, they just, um, uh, uh, they pay a fee and then it's free to everybody to use from their homes and offices. And so we just need to make more people aware of the it. Um, in Miami, they were using it for digital book clubs. Um, in Charlotte, we were blown away when the the public library showed us um, that they, I mean, the library showed us that they had taken all incidents of Charlotte and created a story map that's at the front of the library and that they're going to be using for a walking tour. In North Carolina, they were, they're using it to teach vocabulary in context. I mean, this, you know, at Rutgers, they were using it for a class of faculty members used for a class for entrepreneurship at Clark Atlanta. The, another professor was using it for um, a, a biology class. I mean, we are like that. If that is the end game to take people inside the lives of black people and um, and to raise up the black experience. So, you know, because I was ashamed because my legacy is in the enslaved past. That's a shame. And then the white community doesn't want to be embarrassed. And yet we've worked in unintended publicity to cover up this wonderfully rich history with the other communities sort of on the sides, not knowing, you know, and but hearing, and no one wants to be, you know, any place. And yet we don't want to go in. But what people are missing is. These are wonderful stories. Well, speaking of that, I mean, I was I saw you on 60 Minutes again last night, and the story you told, uh, or one of, uh, we'll talk in a second about your, your connection with the NFL, but one of the stories you chronicle is Jerry Rice, one of my favorite players, and he told this amazing story where his father was a bricklayer, and his, he and his brothers were part of this kind of, you know, team working with his dad, and you know, he developed his skills as receiving by catching bricks that were thrown from one brother that he would catch and hand to to another. I mean, it was just an amazingly kind of vivid, tangible um, kind of evocation of how he developed as a person, as a football player, too. All right, that's right. There's a lot of what we would call lost American stories. And so that's all, you know, what the project is about. You know, every place person needs to have their own sense of identity and legacy, you know, so that um, we just want everybody to join our bandwagon. Um, we didn't know that times would be like they are now, you know, when there are the attacks on it, which are not really warranted, you know. Um, so I, um, you know, I often, when people ask me about the Santos, I say he's not relevant in my book because our project started before that, you know, but I don't want to enter in a, any kind of period of McCarthyism and attacks that are really unwarranted and will leave kids without a sense of identity. You saw those kids in 60 Minutes. They're like, 
these, they have to, I mean, it's like they were giggling, you know, like they, we don't know, we keep hearing the same names, you know, like these adults, they can't, they, they haven't quite gotten, you know, and they're, you know, they're laughing. I mean, let, you know, it was like a, a simultaneous, you know, reaction. I just love that part, you know, because I didn't know those kids. Right. Well, let's talk about your partnership with the NFL, because I mean, that is, to me, a really creative entree into, you know, the most popular sport in America. You know, right. tens of millions of people follow it religiously. So talk about your connection with the NFL and then NFL films. Yeah, I have. Um, we have worked on that collaboration now for it had been worked on for about a decade. But I'm really pleased about it because. They are donating footage from NFL films, um, some people that, you know, were deceased. And so uh, there are, there are uh, about 60 interviews, beautifully shot narrative. And then more importantly, we have a list of about 125 that we're going to be, they're going to be providing free production services. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, it takes both coming together and we wouldn't be, because I told you we were missing on sports. We thought it was covered, but there's something about these life stories that are really important because just like in the Jerry Rice, you learn, you know, his career, but you learn something else about him, the making of him. Right. Well, and one of the players I think you have is Gail Sayers, who of course was a legendary player for the Chicago Bears. And then he later in his career came down to SIU and was athletic director. So I'm eager to uh, to watch uh, to watch that interview. Julianne, we've got a couple of questions that are emailed in, and I wonder if uh, if I can pass them on to you. The first one um, comes from a, a listener who says, it's such an honor to be able to hear about your work directly from you. Do you recall an experience that you had while recording these histories that evoked an unexpected feeling or reaction that you never experienced before then or cannot forget? Um, there is, I would give, um, there, there are two that come to mind. There's a man named Warren Marr who, um, his work um, was um, evidence in the Spielberg movie, um, Debbie Allen movie, um, Amistad. And I just, because how he came to do, to create the Amistad collection, I saw that my work was standing really on his shoulders. And, you know, people like Ira Aldridge, who was a famous black actor, I mean, a lot like of the 18th century. You know, I just got, I got chills. I mean, literally chills. Like I was interviewing, um, I was standing on, you know, holy ground. And then uh, Catherine Dunham is an early interview of mine. She was a creator of Black Dance um, in this country. And just everything about that interview and actually going, the Belafontes had put her up in New York. It moved her from East St. Louis um, after she had come back from Haiti. And just all aspects, you know, her mother, French Canadian, 20 years older than her father, uh, the story of sort of growing up in Peoria, a uh, south side of Chicago and then Peoria, um, going, following her brother to the University of Chicago, um, her legs being um, insured by Lloyds of London when she starred in Cabin in the Sky. The people, you know, her dancers, around her, you know, when I went to visit her daughter, who um, really never grew up in a house and had mixed feelings about her mother. I mean, it, it's just the, uh, you know, just, and yet she was there, like the grand dame she was, ready to tell her story. I mean, lots of things that give me chills or experiences. I consider the interview process really a holy like you're entering holy territory. Um, we're in partnership, as I said, with the interviewer. That's what I emphasize. You know, one of the questions we've made mandatory is what sights and smells remind you of your childhood as we work to reawaken memory. As you're going, you know, you're coming prepared for this interview. So I appreciate that. Right. Another question is, what is your, your view on Black History Month? Is this a sincere effort to understand the African-American experience, 
or a superficial gesture. And I know I've seen in an interview where you've pointed out somewhat archly, but accurately that it's February, which is the shortest month of the year. Um, so comment on that, if you would, please. Um, are, well, okay, I would believe in Black History Month if it were treated with the dignity that it should be. Um, so I often, I'm, at some point, I started sitting it out because I would have people calling me like with these requests. And I'm like, you know, seriously, it comes across the same time every year. You can't plan. And so it was just sort of like thrown together. And that's like, I have mixed feelings about Juneteenth for that reason, you know, because I was like, what, you know? So um, not that I don't believe in Black History Month, I don't believe in how it is treated. That's, and then I was, that's when I saw things were changing. I was on a, a plane with a young um, white um, guy who, um, that's when I, I didn't realize the the changing conservative tide. This was more, you know, before the election of President Trump. And we were, you know, he was sitting next to me talking and he, he was telling me about Robert Lee Day and how, you know, in the South that it was being celebrated instead of uh, Martin Luther King Day and how his family was saying really ugly things about Black people, you know, or, you know, we have... Some in some of the classrooms, you know, I've looked at the student work. This has only happened twice, but the students said who were the you know our material was being used in the classroom that they resented having to study about black people. But on the other hand, you know, I have to say with sixty minutes, like I've had, there was no hate mail, no hate mail. I mean. Emails are flowing in again, and the only thing is I've had the ones that, and I've collected them, who said, where's Clarence Thomas? Where's Condoleezza Rice? And I go, we have wanted them. We are non, like, nonpartisan. We want all voices in. Will you help me? And no one has taken me up on it, but we do have, uh, we've always, uh, we're not political in that way. Right. I have a question that's, well, well, read it directly. It says, should Black, Asian, Native American, et cetera, history be merged into American history class taught K through 12 schools? Why, why not? So, I mean, I guess the broader issue about just really integrating the study of African American history and other communities, you know, this is, I guess, one of the fundamental questions of American education, but how should they be integrated into the entire curriculum? I think, remember how I said uh, to the person who's asking the question and uh, what I said was that you you have to recognize the individual individuality of those experiences before you do any merging because they're different. There are similarities amongst them. And, um, and, you know, I spoke of the lost American stories, which I said, cannot, like, we cannot be the melting pot until we recognize the, the individuality of those, because they are not the same. And, uh, but they point to the richness of the American, the African American experience. And there is also intersectionality between them. You know, Irish are all over our archives. The relationship, I remember the first time I interviewed a man named Edward Williams, who was known in Chicago as the first Black person to integrate the banking system. And I had an assistant at the time, and I said, I hear he's Black, but he looked totally Chinese. And when I went to interview him, I could not figure out. I was asking him, did people call you names when you were growing up? He, there was nothing I could figure out. And he goes at the end of the interview, you know how it was between the chinks and the blacks working on the railroad in the South. No, I did not know at that time how it was. So this, there, there are these important intersections that will take us beyond George Washington cutting down the cherry tree. The fact that I or other communities have no presence, but we do not honor that. We dishonor it 
if we just throw it all together without acknowledging the uniqueness of the different experiences, that would be a travesty, as much a travesty as ignoring and putting down and only raising up one voice and history that is really not correct. History is supposed to be correct. Right. Well, let me ask you, how do you organize your time? I mean, you're doing so many things. You're, you're obviously running a major, growing, thriving entity. Um, I know you have a significant fundraising effort underway. I think you've raised $12.3 million out of your goal of $20 million. Um, I know you do interviews. I, I read a, an earlier interview with you where this was some years ago, but you had done something like um, over 300 interviews. And like in one month, you had done 37 so with all these balls flying through the air, how do you how do you organize your time, Juliana? It's very complicated. I don't want to speak to that, except um, it's really important that we be successful with our goal. And I am very, um, what I think about all the time is building a bench so I could succeed to the bench and that the work can continue. Remember, at one point, I mean, at our beginning, for most of our existence, people maybe thought we were a nice project, but, you know, you know, sort of esoteric. Um, no one, including myself, could have um, seen the days that we're in right now. And so there's this extreme need. And like I said, I didn't know, you know, I knew that there were collections. I did not know there was such the absence of the Black voice. So I, yeah, I struggle. I mean, I struggle with that, you know, how to prioritize. And like I said, I mean, 60 minutes is like a tsunami. And I was thinking last night, I mean, our site got taken down again for the second time. But it's the, you know, I look at the things and I have like 76 year old Polish Americans writing to me, encouraging me. I mean, that for whatever amount of being tired, I, you know, those things are encouraging and push me on. So, I mean, but if anyone, first of all, we'd love SIU to join our subscription. Well, I am going to send a note to the dean of their library as soon as we get off this uh, interview. You know, so. and, and for it to be used in the classroom. I mean, I that would be really important to me. And, but I also, you know, in any way, like I'm really trying to, hire and build our bench and um, and take those resources and partnerships are really important to us. And I really appreciate the time and effort you put into this interview um, because um, you did your homework. So I appreciate that. Great. Well, just a final question, Juliana, because we have some students on, on the call. And you know, I, one question I like to ask as I end my interviews is like, what have you learned in your life? What do you wish that your 20 year old self knew as you began to launch a career? And, and as your story shows, I mean, you've tried out a lot of different things. You've learned, you've been at the end of at this point in your career, it seems like you've been able to pull together so many different strands. But, but you know, when you're talking to a student on a plane or on a train or something and they say, you know, what kind of advice would you give about organizing my career? What What do you say? I want for um, students and anyone to find their passion in life because I think passion meeting purpose and discipline, um, you can do extraordinary things and think about it. As my father pointed out, I mean, theater, storytelling. American studies, that's what I'm doing. And that was formed um, in my sophomore year at Brandeis. So, I mean, I really, at the end of the day, came back to that. And, um, and so I will feel, you know, so there are lots of needs out here. Some people work a nine to five, you know, and there are, their um, hobbies are outside. Some people, like myself, live their work. But at the end of the day, you know, we all can do tremendous things, um, even if it is, you know, that, um, you know, we have children and they go on to productive lives and make, you know, our productive citizens. I, 
It's just that each of us can contribute. And as we see, there's tremendous needs as we are moving forward in the 21st century for correction, lots of things that are going to be needed and a world that has become in many ways increasingly complicated. So your students, those answers will come from the very students that are in your classroom. Great. Well, thank you. Well, Juliana, thank you so much for really a really delightful conversation and an interesting one, an important one. As I say, I'm going to make sure that SIU is signed up uh, by the end of the week. That's going to be my pledge. Some some unit of SIU will be signed up before uh, before Friday. We're so the library. We need the library and we need you. Okay, so, that, you that sounds good. And I, I'm just going to end by saying, you know, I uh, I know you're busy in Chicago, but if at some point, you know, schedules allow, we'd love to coax you down to Carbondale and speak to the communities here and maybe some of the schools uh, both at junior high and high school and universities and and just tell the story of your um, of the important work you're doing now. I would love to do that. So let's let's consider that a, a future date to do that. And remember, we have a lot of SIU material in there. Um, and so um, and the story of uh, that part of the United States, which is really Southern, you know, as opposed to Northern in many ways. So we we very much would appreciate that. Great. Well, I will stay in touch and look forward to meeting you in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We will have this interview on our website in the coming days. Please pass it on to family and friends. Thanks for supporting the Institute and keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much. Love Paul Simon, too. All right, great. Thank you.